The Zen way of recovery, an illuminated path out of the darkness of addiction with Laura Burgess. Laura Burgess is a lay and trusted Dharma teacher in the Soto Zen tradition. She teaches classes, lectures, and leads retreats in Northern California. Laura co-founded the Shanga in Recovery uh, program at the San Francisco Zen Center and uh, is the abiding teacher at Lennox House Meditation Center in Oakland, California. And uh, her new book is what she's going to discuss with us today, as well as something about herself. Laura is a woman in long-term recovery herself who uses the 12 steps in Zen practice. And her book has been described as an accessible, compassionate guide to Buddhist principles and practices that can help support recovery from addictions and addictive behaviors. Written by an experienced lay teacher in long-term recovery. So, Laura, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. So great to have you with us. And now I'll turn it over to you. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for having me. And a welcome to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, this is a wonderful gift of Zoom that we can come together like this uh, from wherever we happen to be. Uh, I'd like to begin with just a few uh, minutes of uh, guided meditation, and then we'll sit in silence for a few moments, and then um, and then I'll I'll present <laughs> I'll present to you. So uh, you know, I love that set aside prayer about putting everything aside and having an open mind. Uh, before the meeting started, I was talking a little bit about Suzuki Roshi, who founded the San Francisco Zen Center, where I've practiced for many years. And his book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, is a classic of Zen literature. And one of the reasons he really enjoyed working with Western practitioners was because of their open mind. Uh, and he famously said, and this set aside prayer reminded me of this in the in the experts in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities in the experts mind there are few so having a beginner's mind is so important um you know in recovery we say uh honesty open mindedness and willingness so i'm going to ring the bell just to bring us all together and then i'm going to offer you a guided meditation that's from the book, Expand This Moment by John Selby. Taking a few deep breaths, let's fully enter this moment with one another, such a precious moment to share with each other. And let's extend our hearts to one another around the world. Bring your mind fully into your body and visit any place in your body that may feel tense or unattended and gently release any tension or preoccupation that might be obscuring this present moment for you. When you breathe, imagine that your breath is entering every single cell in your body. We have such deep communication and communion with trees who offer us uh, shade, medicine, fruit, beauty, and of course, the air that we breathe. I'm going to say some phrases and I'd like you just to hold each phrase in your mind and body for a moment and then let it go, always being aware of the breath. I choose to enjoy this moment. I feel the air flowing in and out of my body.
I also feel the movements in my chest and belly as I breathe. I'm aware of my whole body at once, alive and awake here in this present moment. I am ready to experience the feelings in my heart. I let go of all my stress and worries and feel peaceful inside. I accept everyone I know just as they are. I honor and love myself just as I am. I am open to receive. I feel connected with my source. I am here to love, to serve, to prosper, and to enjoy myself. I am ready to act with courage and integrity. I choose to enjoy this moment. Again, welcome. Uh, my name is Ryuko Laura Burgess, and I, uh, I'm an alcoholic. And in the meditation that I just shared with you, I love that phrase, I choose to enjoy this moment. I discovered through my twin paths of practice and recovery from alcoholism that I have a choice. I have a choice about what to pay attention to, where to put my energy, who to hang around with, and uh, how to live my life. And when I was tethered to alcohol, I didn't have those kind of choices. Um, I understand this is a meeting for people in all kinds of recovery, and I, I really celebrate that. I 
qualify for many groups, but I, I did plant my little flag in AA. <laughs> so I speak from the point of view of alcoholism, and I hope you can look for the similarities and identify, uh, you know, the Buddha, the Buddha said that human suffering is caused by craving, craving. And uh, in Sanskrit, that word is tanha, which literally means thirst. And so those of us in recovery are really very um, fortunate that we have a very vivid example of the kind of craving that causes suffering. I want to start by just telling you about a little bit about myself. I grew up in the East Bay. I'm in San Francisco right now. And so I still know a lot of the kids I grew up with. And when we became adults, many of us uh, had problems with drugs and alcohol. And as we began to open up about um, the households we grew up in, I found out that many of the kids that I was drawn to as I was growing up were growing up with alcoholism in their family. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> we knew we weren't supposed to talk about that. And yet we felt this affinity um, with people growing up around this disease. Um, I started drinking in high school. And when I first started drinking, it gave me so much, you know, I was a, a very shy person and alcohol for me seemed to melt the painful barriers between me and other people. I was able to talk to anybody and dance all night and be a wild woman. And I loved that. And, you know, the next day I could blame it all on alcohol. Uh, my first love was my high school sweetheart and, um, uh, he was also alcoholic, I came to, to know very deeply. And we had some wonderful adventures behind alcohol. You know, just this crazy yes to life. Uh, and uh, we were together for, for a number of years. Uh, in our early 20s, we decided to save up some money and travel overland, travel to Europe. And once we were in Europe, we met people coming back from the East. And we realized that our money would go a lot farther if we traveled overland from Europe to India. And that was a wonderful, wonderful trip. But because of our drinking and drug use, we got into many dangerous situations. Um, we slept in construction sites and under freeway overpasses. And uh, we, when we were in Herat, Afghanistan, we found the opium den and spent time there finding out only later that op using opium was against the law for Westerners and that there were Westerners who'd been incarcerated for long periods of time for using drugs and even alcohol in those Muslim countries. Uh, we made it all the way to India and came back. And then we, um, we really had culture shock when we came back from that trip. So we lived in Pacific Grove, California, which is a sleepy little town on the Monterey Peninsula. And drinking and uh, drugging were part of our lives. Some kind of inner wisdom made me realize that I couldn't stay with this man and, and be healthy and happy. And as much as I loved him, I, I left and I went up to Juneau, Alaska. Uh, many of the people we met in Pacific Grove were studying Russian at the Language Institute in Monterey. And um, we went up to Alaska. I went up to Alaska on my own. I knew some people there. I built a platform out in the woods and got a tent from Sears Roebuck. And I, you know, I'd gone up there to be this wild woman and be independent. And I heard, I heard, I heard somebody in a meeting there say, I took a train, but my alcoholism took a plane. So when I got to Juneau, Alaska, my alcoholism was waiting for me. And, you know, I found out that I was perfectly capable of drinking myself into oblivion without this man at my side who I could look to and say, wow, he drinks a lot more than I do. And again, I had a lot of fun. Um, I would drink in the bars there. I never did explore the wilderness. I, uh, I just to give you an idea of my drinking in Juneau, um, I could stand on my head, even if I was blind drunk. So at the Red Dog Saloon, I would bet people 10 bucks that I could stand on my head. And uh, 
that would buy the next round of drinks. The only problem with that was there was uh, sawdust on the floor at the Red Dog Saloon. So I'd go around for the rest of the night with sawdust in my hair. Um, what really got my attention? Well, I, well, I started to realize I had a problem with alcohol in, in Alaska. And what was really interesting was when I got there in May, it was the land of the midnight sun. And as the months progressed and as my alcoholism progressed, it got darker and darker, literally darker. And I, I think of that time now as traveling to the heart of darkness. I came across the 20 questions in Juno, and I answered yes to many of those questions, even though I was only 22 years old. I remember walking by uh, a bar during the day and looking in and seeing Native women drunk with their heads down on the bar and a little voice in my head said, that's you, you're like that. And I thought, no, I'm not, you know, I'm just here having a good time. I didn't know that that was the voice of my higher power. And then uh, one night after a lot of drinking at the Red Dog, I came to out of a blackout crawling through the snow. And I'm very lucky that I came to because Many people die that way in those northern countries. And I found myself living in a cabin in the wintertime. I left my tent behind and moved into a little cabin in town. And I found myself thinking of suicide. And I had this little glimmer of hope that maybe there was another way to live. Maybe it had something to do with the way I was living. And I left Juno and I came back to San Francisco where I experienced pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. I did not want to drink the way I drank, and yet I couldn't seem to help it. And um, I'd have a couple of drinks and get really drunk, or I'd drink all night long and not feel a thing because my tolerance for alcohol had changed. And um, after a very bad run, I got really sick. I smoked a lot of cigarettes and drank some really cheap wine. And the next day I couldn't even think of picking up a drink. And in that little window, I started a spiritual search. I left alcohol behind. I regretted the past and wished to shut the door on it. And I went shopping for a spiritual way of life. I tried the yogis, but I didn't like wearing white pajamas. I tried the Quakers, but, um, they would sit in silence, but then after a while, somebody would start talking. And I really liked sitting in silence. So when I knocked on the door of the San Francisco Zen Center, I thought whoever opened the door would say, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And I wouldn't be able to answer that and they would tell me to go away, but that didn't happen. So I, I, I had stopped drinking cold turkey. I entered Zen practice with so much passion, you know, uh, we say in Zen that we practiced as if to save our head from fire. And I was very soon living in a monastery, the Tassara Zen Monastery, um, which is the first Buddhist monastery in, in the United States. And I, again, I just plunged into practice, getting up at 4.30 in the morning to meditate, uh, doing physical work. I learned how to cook in the kitchen and um, I met my husband there, we got married, and um, on our wedding night, I hadn't had a drink in five years through Zen practice, through the rigor and the di discipline of Zen practice. I thought that Zen practice was the opposite of alcoholism. But on our wedding night, my husband opened a bottle of champagne that somebody had given us. And this little voice in my head said, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a glass of champagne. And so I, I said to my husband, I'll have a glass of that. Now, mind you, I'd never told him the knockdown drag out story of my drinking. I had just kept that to myself. But this little voice told me, you know, it's okay to have a drink. You know, you've, you've shown you can make a commitment. I'd been married for six hours. So I think that showed that I could make a commitment, you know. And um, so I had that glass of champagne and nothing terrible happened. And nothing terrible happened right away. We moved back to San Francisco and um, 
that marriage fell apart, although I had a beautiful daughter, and I drank for another five years. Now, at this point, it was no longer acceptable for me to drink the way I like to drink. And so I became a periodic drinker, and it was really miserable. I wasn't drinking with wild abandon the way that I had. I was drinking secretly, I thought, trying to hide it from my daughter, trying to hide it from my Zen community. And um, <clears throat> I decided to go back to school to get a teaching credential. But uh, I got very, very drunk one night. I drove drunk. I broke all my promises to myself. And I found myself the next day sitting in a classroom at San Francisco State. And I had a moment of clarity. I thought to myself, I'm 35 years old. I've been, uh, I've had so many blessings in my life. I've traveled the world. I have wonderful Buddhist teachers. I have a beautiful daughter and, and, uh, and yet I've made absolutely no spiritual progress since I was 18 years old and drinking down in the dorms at San Francisco State. I was shaking, I was sick. And something happened to me that I've heard other people talk about. This had never happened to me before. Sitting in that classroom, something deep inside me called out, please, please help me. Please help me. And I had no idea who I was asking for help. But I got up out of that class and I went out in the hallway. They used to have this thing called um, phone booths. And I, and I went into this phone booth and there was a phone book in that phone booth. And I called a recovery program. And the next day I, um, I had two beers that night. And the next day I stepped into Al Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I'm one of those fortunate people who hasn't had a drink since September 28th, 1985. And relapse is a part of recovery. And I understand that. The way I see it is that I was so beat up by alcohol that I was ready to do anything. And um, I had all my slips before I came into the program because I kept trying and trying to stop on my own. And, um, you know, at the end of my practice, I mean, at the end of my drinking there in, the, in 1985, I thought, wait a minute, there's so many fabulous Buddhist teachers who can sit still as I could for seven days in a row in a Buddhist retreat, sit still for seven days in a row, and yet they'd either harmed or destroyed their communities with their own addictions. These were wonderful teachers who could give us beautiful Dharma talks and smile beautifully. And yet, because of their addiction to substances or sex, or whatever had deeply harmed their communities. And so, you know, I did write this book called The Zen Way of Recovery. I'm gonna hold it up. Um, the Zen Way of Recovery, an illuminated path out of the darkness of addiction. And really what made me wanna read this book is that Buddhism did not cure my alcoholism. I wish it had, but what I needed to do was come into the rooms of recovery and hear these Corny phrases, you know, first things first, easy does it, live and let live. I needed to sit next to people I might never have met otherwise. I remember sitting next to a houseless man who was still living on the streets, but had been sober longer than I had. And I knew he had something to teach me. So I opened myself up to this program. I got a sponsor and um, I, I celebrate my birthday in September, but I um, still attend meetings. I still get so much out of your recovery. You know, some of my sober friends say, why do you still go to those meetings when, when you've been sober for so long? And what happens to me in a meeting is when I hear your story, my own sobriety is reignited and renewed and reaffirmed because I hear about your journey. I hear about you walking along the same, the same suffering path I walked along as an alcoholic. You know, I was totally 
baffled why I couldn't handle alcohol. And then as I did, you came to a, a point in the path where you just took another direction through the magic of your higher power. You were able to turn in the appropriate direction and start living a life of wholeness. Um, I think people come to our to our meeting at Zen Center sometimes because they feel that they might not have to confront the word God at, at Zen Center. Uh, I did not mind hearing the word God when I came to Zen Center. Um, I felt that that was, uh, for me, that would have just been an excuse not to get sober. And in fact, those of us who have led those meetings on Monday night at Zen Center, uh, we reassure everybody there that we still attend 12-step meetings to support our Buddhist practice. And I've even told people, if I had to choose between recovery or practice, I would have to choose recovery because I have to take care of my alcoholism every single day. Uh, I remember telling a friend of mine who's not an alcoholic that at, when it was my AA birthday, and she had the wisdom to say to me, I know for you, it's a choice you make every single day not to drink. And I do that because I get the support I need in recovery and that frees me to practice buddhism so thank you very much for listening to my story uh i haven't gone into sobriety very much because um i want to instead share with you um a, a chapter from my book which actually talks about recovery and sobriety and zen practice so this is chapter four from my book, uh, The Zen Way of Recovery. And by the way, my book is published by Shambhala Publications, and it's available widely. You can get it on Shambhala uh, or Amazon, um, other outlets and independent bookstores as well. So if, if this intrigues you, I hope you'll um, take a look at this book for yourself or for someone you love. It also addresses other 12-step uh, issues rather, rather than just alcohol. So our great Zen ancestor, Dogen Zenji, he was a 12th century monk who brought Zen from China to Japan. When he was giving his instructions for meditation, he said, take the backward step that turns the light and shines it inward. Take the backward step that turns the light and shines it inward. And I love this phrase because this is what we do in meditation. We, we sit down in the middle of our life and we just feel our aliveness. And other things come to mind, other things float up when we're meditating and we notice them and let them go. But in recovery, we also turn the light and shine it inward we shine it inward on our suffering as addicted people. And we learn in the rooms how to address our suffering. So I'm going to read this chapter to you, and it's called Living from the Inside Out. Practicing Buddhism and recovery, we learn to live from the inside out. We learn to cultivate an inward uh, integrity that guides us rather than being blown about by our impulses, like branches torn apart in a cyclone. We have a sense of coming home. Even if we have been abandoned by others in the past, we learn that we don't have to abandon ourselves. Once we've learned to recognize and yet not to act on our addictive impulses, we learn how to cope with strong feelings when they arise rather than denying them, pushing them away, or self-medicating. I think I felt that with Buddhist practice, I could glide over difficult feelings and experiences with a serene smile on my face, that I could put on a black robe and chant in Japanese and be someone else. I thought it might be easier to become someone else than it was to be myself. But that didn't work for me. I needed to feel things deeply and fully so that I could live deeply and fully. 
What I learned in recovery is that I don't have to act on my feelings to be authentically myself. Paradoxically, that means that I can confront feelings honestly, knowing they won't destroy me or the people around me because I can decide when it is appropriate to act on them. I want to just say that um, in recovery, I also realized that I'd grown up in an alcoholic home. You know, when you're growing up in an alcoholic home, you just think that's normal. You don't realize that you're growing up in an alcoholic home. And this, this understanding that I didn't have to act on my feelings, that was not something I learned in an alcoholic home. In fact, I didn't even know what I felt, which is one of the hallmarks of children who grow up in, with alcoholism. So this was a really wonderful thing for me to realize. Buddha taught the great truth of impermanence, this tender sadness that comes with being alive. Friends die, children grow up, we face rejection and loss. Those who we love let us down. We feel mad and sad and incomplete. And if we can deeply accept these feelings and walk through them to the other side, we build strength within ourselves that we can share with others. We stay with that sadness rather than being ashamed of it or trying to make it go away. We stay with that sadness. We make friends with it. We make friends with what we might have previously rejected in ourselves and others, going wide eyed into those dark places, knowing that we will survive. And we know that whatever is happening, this too will pass. I learned that nothing that could happen to me would be improved with the addition of alcohol. When I got sober, I heard people say, you don't have to drink if you don't want to. But I was much more relieved to hear, you don't have to drink even if you do want to. That's what I needed to hear. Because I knew I'd continue to want to drink. And I had to learn how not to, right? All that you love will be carried away. All that you love will be carried away. I wish I could say that I read that in the Buddha Sutras, but this phrase appears as graffiti in a phone booth in a Stephen King story. If we hold this truth to the center of our lives, we will be more likely to seize the present moment and to love the ones we love more fiercely, knowing that all of this is temporary. We will be more likely to honor our commitments, find our own path, express our creativity, and hope, help those we can help. Vine Deloria, the Native American author, theologian, and activist, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase, she is credited with saying, Religion is for those who don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is for those who've been there and don't want to go back. If you have a history of struggling with substances, self-destructive behavior, or the addictions of those who you love, you have been in hell. This gives you a unique ability to connect with others who are in hell and offer a hand in the darkness. It is only by being true to what we see in the dark, that we can emerge into the light whole again and able to reach out to others. Much of this strength comes from finding and practicing and recovering with others who want what we want. There's this very famous story. It shows up in lots of different cultures. Uh, it's called the allegory of the long spoons. Um, in hell, people sit at tables that are piled high with delicious food. But because each of them has a spoon that is longer than their arm, they can't get the food close enough to their mouths to eat it. And so they starve. In heaven, people sit at tables piled high with delicious food. Each of them has a spoon that is longer than their arm and they are happily using their spoons to reach across the table and feed one another. 
While recovery is an, is an inside job, we can't underestimate the importance of the nourishment we receive from others in our program. In recovery, we live with this paradox. We live our life with greater integrity from the inside out, but we also learn how to open ourselves to the help of others. You know, I really think that if I'd come into AA and gotten what I needed and left, well, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have stayed with me for one thing. But I want to be there for other people that come into the program because other people were there for me. And I don't think I've ever been in a meeting where I didn't hear something that was a jewel, you know, that helped me in my recovery. My first Buddhist teacher stopped me in the hall outside the meditation room one morning and told me, you have everything you need. Just stop looking for answers outside yourself. This was an invitation to start living from the inside out, to, to turn that light and shine it inward. Uh, in that moment, the true gift of Buddhism began to manifest for me because I came to understand that this ancient path does not ask me to withdraw my common sense, to subscribe to a particular set of beliefs, or follow a teacher mindlessly. You know, there, there are a lot of lists in Buddhism, but you don't have to ascribe to any of them to be a Buddhist. Buddhism is an experiment with, your, with our own behavior and our own experience. Even the Buddha said, don't take it from me, you know, find out from yourself what your truth is. In Soto Zen, the emphasis is on just sitting, just sitting down in the middle of your life. And each time we sit down, we honor and affirm our own gift of awakening, our own inherent ability to wake up. We're not what worshiping Buddha. We're looking at his example of awakening. We honor those who went before us, both in practice and in recovery, because their persistence and dedication comes down to us as a gift. We sit with our whole selves, with this very mind and body, not with some ideal self that we might achieve someday. This, this same Master Dogen said, this very mind is Buddha. This very mind, this addictive mind, this suffering mind, this faulty mind is Buddha, not, not some other better mind <laughs> that awaits me. When I stepped into the Zendo for the first time, I did so with the hope that Buddhism would fix me, make me better, help me live a better life. I would dive into this ancient stream of Buddhist practice, leaving my broken self behind. This is outside in thinking, using practice, practice in a mecha mechanical fix it kind of way. That was how I used alcohol, bringing something outside of myself into my body to make me feel better. The word intoxicate means to bring poison in. When I used Buddhism in the same kind of way as a kind of antidote to the way I actually felt and who I actually was, trying to fix myself and deny the rejected parts of myself, my practice was hollow and, though well-intentioned, lifeless. In Buddhism and in our work in recovery, we can start living dynamically from the inside out. In the Fukan Zazengi, the instructions for meditation, Dogen says, take the backward step that turns the light and shines it inward. This is counter to everything our culture is telling us. We're, we're told that happiness and success is getting all the good stuff that's out there. Doesn't matter how you get it. You can lie, cheat, and steal. We have an excellent example of this right here in the United States. <laughs> The second most, the most important thing is not to be a loser, a loser. When we step onto the path of practice and recovery, we can stop looking outside of ourselves for satisfaction. We can mine for riches at the vivid center of our own life. Buddhism teaches us that to be alive is to lose. All that you love will be carried away. The things that we cling to and identify with don't last. And yet we can find peace and serenity amid that loss. 
The only place we could rest in is in this very moment, living deeply and richly and fully right now, meeting each person and event with an open heart. This is where we have a chance to meet joy, to come home to our breath and to our true nature. And we can do this with others rather than in a stagnant pool of self. At the end of my drinking, I felt I was in this little stagnant pool with no outlet, with no fresh air, with no fresh water. Whenever I get the blues and sit down and watch that happening, it is just, it is often the case that I am engaging in outside in kind of thinking, judging myself by some outside standard, regretting the past, fearing the future. This is where the corrosive habit habits of resentment and self-pity take root. When I expect, uh, when I begin to expect things from others that they don't even know about, when I start to expect things of myself that I haven't worked to put into place, forgiving myself, forgiving others, recognizing that we're all just doing the best that we can, helps me return to living from the inside out. I couldn't fully come to Buddhism until I got sober and did the work, the self-examination and the actions to be taken that recovery required. First, I had to do that from the inside out, not because I wanted to please people, not that I loved, not to be a better mother, not to become a better person. I had to deeply admit this fundamental truth that I am alcoholic and can never drink like other people something I proved to myself time and time again. I have met other Buddhists who reject the word alcoholic or who are uncomfortable with it, maybe because they don't want to label themselves, maybe because they feel that to practice Buddhism, they need to drop their personal story. For me, all my freedom and joy spring from being able to honestly admit this undeniable fact. I had to become who I actually am. I knew that I couldn't do that and continue to drink. And I needed to remember my story, to tell it to other people so that I would never forget where I came from and to give others a chance to identify with my story so that they would know that recover, recovery is in with reach and for me to open my heart to your story as well. Second, so first I had to ask for help. Second, I had to be willing, first I had to admit I was alcoholic. Then secondly, I had to be willing to ask for help. At the very end of my drinking, as I told you, something called out from the depths of my being, please, please help me. I didn't know that I was on the threshold of awakening to a power within myself that I had not been able to access. Third, I had to be willing to accept that help. This required the annihilation of any kind of intellectual pride. I had to put aside everything that I thought I knew about myself and be willing to open myself to and learn from other people who had discovered how to stay sober. In many cases, these were people who seemed to be very different from me. And yet I found that we shared this disease and the potential to overcome it. And finally, I had to be willing to offer myself the same help that had been so freely given to me. I had to reach out into the darkness and help pull other suffering people into the lifeboat of recovery. So in the actions that I took in recovery, and it says something like this in the big book, I began to find a deep inner resource within me that had been previously unavailable to me. And I found that because of this path of rigorous honesty, self-reflection and action that had not been available to me despite years, 10 years of meditation and Buddhist study. And finally, I had to not be afraid of the word God, which often comes up in recovery programs. I had to cultivate the humility to accept things that my intellectual pride might have rejected. For someone like me, I had turned my will in my life over to the care of alcohol. It seemed a little hypocritical to think that I couldn't get sober if I had to be in a room where people use that word. 
So I just came to feel that the word God points to a mystery that I cannot begin to understand with my limited intelligence. In Zen we say, a finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The word God is a finger pointing at something we can never fully comprehend, a mystery beyond, beyond understanding, and yet a mystery that helps us every day. And I, for me, part of that power that's greater than myself is the collective intention, our collective intention to change our lives and stay sober. And I find this in the rooms of recovery, and it gives me the strength to take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. These are the three jewels of Buddhist practice. Taking refuge in Buddha is having faith in my own inherent awakeness, in my own higher power. Taking refuge in Dharma is letting go and accepting what Suzuki Roshi called things as it is. You know, in recovery, we say life on life's terms. And taking refuge in Sangha is finding solace in connection and community. Sangha is a community of Buddhist practitioners. Taking refuge in the three jewels is a power greater than myself, and that is all I need to know. Buddhism is an invitation to return to our common sense, to sing, see things as they are without lying to ourselves about what is or fantasizing about what might be. To fully enter the present moment, eyes wide, open and respond appropriately to what life asks of us. I would say that recovery asks nothing less. When I was seven years old, my father and my brother and I traveled by car across the United States from New York to California. We stopped at a county fair in the Midwest and roamed around the fair drinking milk right out of the cow and going on rides. One was a, called a teacup ride. My brother Peter and I climbed into a giant teacup and the man who ran the ride turned it on and the teacups began to spin around. My dad was a wonderful man and a very friendly guy and he went over to shoot the breeze with the man running the ride. My dad had his back to us, so he didn't see me thrashing around in the teacup, my hair flying as I howled in terror. My brother tried to show me how to brace myself by holding on to the safety bar, but I didn't get it. Finally, thankfully, the ride stopped and I wiped the tears from my face and tried to smooth my tangled hair. For me, this experience became a metaphor for the way that I'd gone through life at the mercy of my strong emotions and random experiences, never realizing that I could protect myself by developing a strong inner guide that would encourage me to live from the inside out, that I could brace myself with the safety bar offered to me by the sober beings who had gone before me and by the ancient Zen practice that allows me to be fully myself. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, at the end of each chapter in this book, I offer some practices and reflections. And one of them is just to sit silently in our Zazen practice, our meditation posture, coming back to our breath. Uh, in this chapter, I suggest three questions that we can, we can turn within ourselves. Um, I think often I medicated myself because I felt abandoned. I had felt abandoned as a child, and I medicated myself whenever I fe felt rejected or abandoned or confused. So one question is, at what times in your life have you felt abandoned? At what times in your life have you felt abandoned? As I look back on my life, because I, aband I felt abandoned, I, I abandoned myself to substances and behaviors that were self-destructive. So the second question is, at what times have you abandoned yourself? At what times have you abandoned yourself?
And then uh, this third question comes out of that experience I had of sitting in that classroom and recognizing that I needed to go a different way in my life. And, and when I went that different way, I had a pretty good idea I wasn't going to be able to hang out with my drinking buddies or do the things I did as an alcoholic. So the third question is, when did you find, when did you have to find your own way going against what others thought you should do? And what was the outcome? What was the outcome for you when you listened to that inner guide that uh, led you in, in a different direction than the one you, you'd gone in your whole life? So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to